بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين واجعلنا للمتقين إماما I want to start by making a request in the spirit of the subject that we're dealing with. At the end of my speech, some of you might feel obligated, even out of a sense of what you've been doing already, to applaud. I don't think I'll benefit much from your applaud, even though I appreciate the gesture, but I think I'll appreciate more if you just make dua for me and my family. So that would be a favor that you would do for me and for all of the uh, noble scholars that are here uh, that have presented, and if, they've, if you've benefited from them, then absolutely make dua for them and also make dua for their families. I have very little to add uh, to what's already been said in regards to this awesome subject, but I do want to divide my conversation with you into two parts. The first of them is something about my personal life, something uh, that has to do with dua that I want to share with you, and it's not really as out of a spirit of boasting or uh, you know, exposing, but really I think it's something that many of you probably can relate to and maybe find even encouragement in. And then I want to share with you my favorite dua in the Qur'an, inshallah ta'ala. And those are the only two things I want to do with you guys today. I was about almost 20 years of age and I absolutely head over heels fell in love. I went into a masjid in Ramadan and I heard a remarkable scholar explain the Qur'an. I had not read the Qur'an except in translation before that day. And I heard him speak about the Qur'an in the form of almost a conversation. And you know the Qur'an is Allah Azza wa Jal speaking to us directly. And it felt like that for me for the first time. And he was doing this every night of Ramadan, for about four hours every night, to go through the entire Qur'an in this fashion. And I attended this entire series with him because I was hooked completely. I was mesmerized by this book. I was completely overwhelmed that I didn't have any clue, no idea what this book was that was always there and I always thought, yeah, I've read something from it or some translation or something I have an idea what it says I guess I know what it, I know what it has to say but when I heard what it really had to say for the first time I felt like there's this person in, there's this, person, this, this book that I love so much and I have no relationship with it and of course the barriers were many, including the knowledge of it, but of course even the language. I had no idea what the Arabic language was. Not a clue. The only thing I could do at that time, you know what it was? Is to make dua. So I just asked Allah something very simple. I didn't even know how to ask it in Arabic or anything. I didn't know any duas by heart. So I just asked Allah, Oh Allah, I love your book. I just, I love your book. And I'd love nothing more but to learn it and to teach it. Just make it easy for me to learn it. And make it easy for me to teach it. Because I love your book. That's all I asked. And I swear to you by Allah, I am a terrible student of anything. Terrible. I mean, especially languages. I'm absolutely horrendous. I was not a good student in college. I used to hate studying. The, you know, if anybody, if, if I ever had sleep problems, the easiest way to meet, for me to catch some sleep was to open up a textbook. Ten seconds later, I'll have 12, 13 hours of solid sleep because <laughs> nothing will knock me out like studying. But this teacher who was presenting the Qur'an also happened to be teaching an Arabic class. And when I attended his class, wallahi, it was like knots opening up. I couldn't stop studying. I couldn't stop, I couldn't put the books down. I couldn't stop thinking about it. I was doing like conjugations in my sleep. <laughs> Going through grammar in my sleep. I was studying it in the train. I became, I was doing it at work, at school, all the time. I just became obsessed with it. And wallahi, what people around me found so difficult, Allah made it so easy for me. And I knew something had just happened. Allah has given me a gift in response to my dua. 
And wallahi, I tell you, to this day, if I try to study anything else, I have a hard time. But when I study Quran, I can spend hours and hours and hours and it's easy for me. Walhamdulillah, it's a gift of Allah to me. But this is something that I've personally experienced in terms of the power of dua. Just the power of dua. Subhanallah, I don't mean to say this is a means of boasting, but look, I have, walhamdulillah, I've taught Arabic courses all over the country, maybe close to now 15,000 students. Subhanallah. And not any of them have benefited anything except from the gift that Allah has given. And if they're able to continue that, and enti that entire benefit starts from one dua, as far as I'm concerned. Subhanallah. So that was a little bit about my personal story. But what I want to really share with you is my favorite dua in the Quran. And I think it's a very relevant dua for pretty much all of us here in the audience. And to set the stage for this dua, I'm sure some of you have heard me talk about this dua before, but I personally don't care. I'm going to repeat it because فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ فَعَتِ الذِّكْرَ Remind, reminder has benefit. So I hope to benefit myself and all of you with this reminder. There's a powerful expression in the Qur'an. It's captured in two words. Those two words are قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنْ The coolness of the eyes. A simple translation will yield coolness of the eyes. And it's mentioned in a number of occasions. It's also found in a hadith of the Messenger wasallam. Okay. Before I tell you how it's used in sacred text, I want to tell you how the ancient Arabs used to use this figure of speech, this expression. It's really a figure of speech, so we can't really understand it literally. It means something more. In the Arab idiom, there were two expressions. Without getting too technical with you guys, there's the eyes becoming cool and the eyes becoming warm. That's the first thing I'd like you to know. The Arabs had two figures of speech, the eyes becoming cool and the eyes becoming warm. When somebody is shedding tears of sorrow, they're suffering the worst kind of fate. They are in deep depression and sadness and calamity. Then when you would look at them, the Arab would say at least, his eyes have become warm. One of the worst curses, you can curse upon someone in the Arabic language, in ancient Arabic, Allahu aynahu, may Allah make his eyes warm. Means may he suffer the worst kinds of sorrows in his life. The exact opposite is what? the eyes becoming cool. For your sorrows, for your sadness, for your pains to be removed completely, and for you to feel peace and tranquility and joy like nothing else. And I'll give you, I'll give you a simple example of coolness and warmth of the eyes before I continue. Imagine you're at the airport, right? And there are two pair, there's a pair of a mother and a son, and another mother and another son. But this mother is saying farewell to her son. He's flying off somewhere. And the other mother is greeting her son who flew in from somewhere, and both of the mothers are crying. But one of them, their eyes is cool, and the others, the eyes are warm. One is shedding tears of joy, she sees her son after many years. She's crying too, but these are eyes becoming cool. The others letting go of her son, these are what? The eyes becoming warm. You understand the difference, right? Now, another, you know, a few pieces of context before I go further. The poet in Arabia says, my, the, the eyes of my tribe will remain warm. And he's actually an assassin also. Yeah, poets are assassins. It's kind of an Arab thing, I guess. But, so he's waiting on a sand dune, waiting to kill the tribe leader that has offended his tribe. And he makes poetry in the meantime. <laughs> I guess he's got a lot of time. So he says, the, 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 my tribe's eyes will remain warm until my dagger is warm, isn't warm with his blood. In other words, when I, when I kill this guy, then my, my tribe's eyes will become cool. The rage, the frustration, the humiliation they feel will only disappear upon this guy's death. That's what I'm here to do, to cool the eyes of my tribe. You understand? So it's a means of relieving frustration and anger and ill feelings. That's how the, in, in which context it's used. But then there's a final context that I want to share with you in Arabic literature, where this expression is found. It's very beautiful actually. The Arab used to travel in the desert and there's a sandstorm. And in a sandstorm, the Arab would you know, wrap his face up because obviously your face is being pounded with sand. Now the camel on which he's riding, Allah created the camel in a magnificent fashion. The eyelids of the camel actually trap sand and drop them. It doesn't even have to blink. It's got a screen in front of its eyes that captures sand and drops it. It's, we don't have that, you know, that screen system in our eyes, but the camel does. But now the rider, he can't afford to cover his eyes, can he? Because if he covers his eyes, what's the problem? He doesn't know where he's going. So he has to keep his eyes exposed. And so finally he finds a cave. He finds some refuge. 
And he says, interestingly, my eyes have finally become what? Cool. In other words, in literature, we find the precedent of the eyes becoming cool equated with finding refuge from a storm. Finding refuge from a storm. Now I've set the stage for you for what this expression stands for, but I still haven't told you my favorite dua, though I recited it in the beginning. This is at the conclusion of the 25th surah of the Quran. Allah Azza wa Jal says, Rabbana, He tells us to say, وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ Those who say, رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنْ وَجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا Our Master, our Lord, gift us, grant us. You know in Quran we find atina, give us. A'tina, to give a grand gift. But hab, gift us. An unexpected gift, a beautiful gift. Hab lana. This is a gift you're asking Allah to give you. And lana is muqaddam. This, this prepositional phrase is brought earlier, especially for us. We're asking for a special favor to Allah. And what is this favor that we're asking God? Allah Azza wa Jal? Grant us from our spouses and not just our children, which is awlaad dhurriyatina. You know, wa Future generations of us. In other words, you're not even asking for your immediate children, but your lineage from, you know, for generations to come. Grant us from all of them coolness of eyes. Make our eyes cool by means of our, by means of our spouses and by means of our children. And I say this is a, my, my favorite dua for a reason. One, I'm married and I do have children and a spouse. But two, all of us, all of us, have to appreciate the power of this dua because of the crisis of the world today. The world's fundamental institution of family is under attack. Most of the people here, even Muslims, are not immune from this problem. In many of our homes, the storm that I said, when you find coolness of the eyes, you find refuge from the storm. The storm is not outside the house. The storm is inside the house. And you have to get away from home to get away from the yelling and the screaming and the name calling and the insults and the depression and the sadness and the friction between husband and wife and parent and children. Our homes are broken. Brother is not talking to brother. Parents are not talking to children. How many of all the shuyukh, I can bet you, I can, I can almost guarantee you, all of the speakers that have come to this conference, some mother, some father, some husband, some wife has come up to them and said, I've got this problem. I can't talk to my kid. He yells at me. We can't talk any. He's doing these things. I don't know how to stop him. My husband, my wife, this, my husband, this, subhanAllah. This is a crisis inside the home. And what better dua to ask? The, the exact opposite, you know, the, the family has become a place of sorrow, of depression, of sadness, of anger, of rage. People feel like they want to escape it. And here Allah tells us to ask so perfectly, so eloquently, that the home should become the place of refuge. It's like the outside world is a storm. And you suffer on the outside and your refuge, your safe haven is those doors in your home, is your spouse, is your children. When you see them, your worries disappear. But for most of us, when you see them, your worries begin. <laughs> it's the exact opposite. But I want to give you a, a further appreciation of just this remarkable, beautiful phrase and how it's used in the Qur'an. Just I want to explain this feeling to you that Allah wants us to have with our families. There's some, some more elaboration of those feelings. You know some of the most, the strongest emotion that exists in, in, exist in human existence, the strongest emotion I can think of is the emotion a mother feels for her child. It is the strongest bond. Many of you in the audience are married, and when you're first married, you're obsessed with the husband, you're obsessed with the wife, you are so awesome. No, you're awesome. <laughs> How perfect Allah makes the pairs. I can't believe you're my husband. I can't believe you're... They're like all weird in the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> People look at you funny. You know, the guy's got a goofy smile on his face all the time. Like, you know. And the, the husband's name is mentioned and she gets shy. And, you know. <laughs> Ten years go by. The husband's name is mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> right? But anyway. Before that happens, <laughs> before that, when you have your first child, the husbands will realize this. Already? Okay. All right. The husbands will realize this. You're talking to your wife about something, the baby's in the other room. You don't even, the husband doesn't even have the ears for this one. The baby just does a little, 
That's it, that's all it does. And guess what happens to the mother? That conversation is over. He was in the middle of telling her how his day went and it was really important meeting and... What were you going, what, what happened? Spider sense goes berserk and you go in the other room and you pick up the child. Nothing comes between who? Mother and child, nothing, nothing comes between them. It is the strongest bond. Now I'm talking to the mothers in the audience for a second. Can you imagine the state of Musa's mother's heart? She puts her baby in the water. You can't even leave your child outside in the hall. You start calling your husband, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? Have you seen him? Have you seen him? Where is he at? You can't stop. You're 30 minutes late picking your child up from school. What happens to you? You know. I know, because I've been late picking up my kids from school before. <laughs> so I know what my wife goes through. You didn't make it to the airport in time, right? You haven't seen your kids. You know, even mothers, they're, they're in the home and they, have, they can't see the child. Where'd you go? Abdul Karim, Abdul Karim, where are you? <laughs> I'm in the bathroom, mom, relax, I'm here. But there's this desperate, can you imagine her feeling? She's putting her child in what is apparently certain death. Because what's behind is even more graphic. So she's in this desperate situation. And does she know what happened to the child? She does. Can you imagine not knowing what's happening to your child after you know that they're in a dangerous situation? Can you even imagine? Subhanallah. And on the other hand, I want to give you two women scenarios. On the other hand, and I promise I'll try to finish within five minutes, the, um, there's another woman who's in a storm. In the same story. She's married to a really bad guy. What's his name? Oh yeah, Fir'aun. And you know, sometimes women are in a, in a difficult domestic situation. And usually in, in a society like ours, you can call the domestic hotline, you can call the cops if there's abuse, whatever. Now we don't know if there's physical abuse, but the Quran certainly indicates psychological abuse. So much so that she has to ask for rescue, right? She's in this terrible marriage and she can't even call the cops. Well, why not? Because he owns the cops. She can't complain to the government because he is the government. She's got nowhere to turn. So the only place she can turn is who? Allah, she's in the middle of this storm and she can't find a refuge. But when this baby washes up, you know what she says now? Think about this. She picks up the child and she says, Qurratu Aynin Li. He'll be the coolness of my eye for me. He will be my refuge from the storm. He will be my only source of joy because I'm in the middle of sadness. She's with this child, this motherless woman, she, this childless woman is with this child now and all of a sudden all her problems disappear. That's her first reaction to this child. Subhanallah. And in, on a separate note, she said, Li walak. And that I won't discuss with you, but she separated herself from Fir'aun even in that. He'll be the coolness of my eye for me, for me and even for you. <laughs> even to Fir'aun. But she didn't say for us, because she doesn't even associate herself with him. Subhanallah. Radiallahu anha. Now, one more thing. One last thing. Just about this coolness of the eyes. And why this dua is so beautiful and powerful and eloquent. You know, when a mother has lost her child, which in this case it, she has, and she is reunited with her child. Can you imagine the feeling of a mother whose child was lost and then she was reunited with it? Can you imagine the tears of happiness? Can you imagine that emotion? Now understand how Allah describes that emotion. Allah tells his favor to Musa alayhi salam. He says, فَرَجَعْنَاكَ إِلَىٰ أُمِّكْ كَيْ تَقَرَّ عَيْنُهَا وَلَا تَحْزَنْ so we returned you to your mother, so her eyes could become cool. So her eyes would, Allah is describing the most amazing joy, the most amazing relief, the most indescribable feeling in the heart of a mother. And what expression does he use? The coolness of the eyes, to depict that powerfully. And so we ask Allah, give us from our spouses and our children coolness of eyes. That's what we ask Allah. When somebody said, I want to get married, go further, not just get married. I want to get married to a spouse that will cool my eyes. That I'll be the coolness of their eyes and they'll be the coolness of mine. And Allah Azza wa took the dua further. And then we understand why talk about future generations. And I'll conclude with this. وَجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ imama And make us leaders over those who are cautious, conscious, fearful, pious, righteous. Those who are fearful before Allah. And you know what that makes you realize? It makes you realize your relationships right now aren't just about you. you, have, you have, you're setting a precedent in your family for generations to come. So when you are not acting as good husbands and good wives and good parents and good children, what are your future generations going to be doing? And who's going to be answerable for that negative trend that was started by you? 
Who's gonna be answerable for that? So it's an intelligent dua that we should find coolness of the eyes not only in our immediate family, but the future generation should be people that are righteous too. Because when we're raised on judgment day, we are imam over the entire family, whether they were messed up or not. So it's, we better ask for the kinds of people if they're underneath us, not those who are dragging us down on judgment day, but those who are elevating us. And we beg Allah that He give all of us those kinds of families. So the biggest favor you can do to me and, and, and the scholars here, because none of us are immune from this. This dua is something you and I, everyone, every Muslim, and this is even something that non-Muslims need today. They have no peace in their families. So I beg all of you sincerely that we all make this sincere dua to Allah. Yes, I know time's up, zero minutes. Yeah, zero minutes, really nice. رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنٍ وَجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا I sincerely pray that Allah Azza wa Jal gives all of us and makes from our spouses and our children those that are the coolness of our eyes and that He makes us an imam, a leader over those that are pious and righteous. May Allah forgive all of our shortcomings, accept all of our dua and make the means of our forgiveness easy upon us. But this is once again at the end of Surah Al-Furqan. بارك الله لي ولكم في القرآن الحكيم ونفعني وإياكم بالآيات وذكر الحكيم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله.